Hey everybody, and welcome to the podcast that's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee, and we have a special episode today. Uh, Coach Chad Timmerman is not with us. Instead, uh, we have our CEO, Nate Pearson. Hello. And then we also have a special guest with us here, Andy Blow from Precision Hydration. How you doing, man? Yeah, good. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, of course. Uh, it was kind of funny. So we've talked about sweat and hydration and those sort of things plenty of times on the podcast. You were actually going going to do a hydrate or a sweat test last year at Kona. You were trying to. They wouldn't let me. And then they wouldn't because you weren't an athlete. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about it plenty of times. And, and ever since then, people have been like, you guys should just talk to the folks at Precision Hydration. Yeah. And it's kind of funny because like in an email, I was like, well, I mean, if you guys are ever passing through Reno and they're like, strangely enough, we are. So <laughs> it's yeah. perfect for it. Uh, so thanks for coming on. Uh, can you give people... Uh, a quick little idea, I guess, about what you do. And I yeah. guess let's go into your background as an athlete first so then we can kind of okay. get in a, a premise where we're going. So where did you start with athletics, period, in this regard? Well, well I started um, – the, the the whole thing about hydration for me was that I had loads of problems with it as an athlete. Mm. I started off doing triathlon in the 1990s. I was doing short course stuff, mainly in the, in the UK and in Europe, where, you know, it can get warm, but it's not super hot. Yeah. And so – I, I was getting on okay there, qualified to do some Ironman races in hot places, Kona and uh, some in the, the sort of um, Asia and that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. I would just bomb, basically, <laughs> completely. There's no other word to describe it. I would have a terrible time. Yeah. I always knew I sweated a lot. That mm -hmm. was pretty obvious. If you've, you know, you, if I sit next to a spin, next to you in a spin class, then you're you in can trouble. tell. Yeah, there's water <laughs> on the floor. I'm like, I've ruined so many bikes on my turbo trainer. They rusted to hell. You know? so, um, but what I didn't know, which I subsequently learned, was that I lose a lot of salt in my sweat. Mm. So I would really, really, you know, really fizzle out basically um, in the heat. And it was a friend of mine who was a doctor, noticed all the salt on my kit, and he said, I think we should get your sweat tested. And I, was a f I have a background in physiology, so I was vaguely aware of some of this, but I didn't realize there was such individual variance in sweat sodium. And my, my friend said, when we have this test, I reckon that you'll be off the charts high with the amount of salt you lose. And I was kind of like, yeah, okay, we'll see. Went and did it. He was right. You know, we changed what I was drinking, changed the amount of electrolytes I was taking, and you know, a little bit of trial and error later, and I was racing in the heat absolutely fine. It was like night and day. Huh. Wow. So for me as an individual, it was a, a huge game changer. And as an athlete, I have to be honest, I sort of filed that away as a bit of useful information for me and parked it really. But when I stopped competing and was starting to work with athletes as a sports scientist and a coach, I invested in some sweat testing kit because I was like, this, I'm interested in this now. Let's see if this can help other people. And that's kind of the roots of what we do now. Huh. Cool. It's pretty sweet because that's uh, that's something that <clears throat> I honestly like. Yeah, been through a lot of sweating situations, everything else like that. But ever since we went to Kona, then I realized like how severe it really can be because that like the environment that you have there is like so punishing and severe. And seeing multi sport athletes having to deal with that, it's like a, a totally different different ordeal. So maybe we want to jump in with like some basic questions, like first, right? Yeah, it's gonna like, sound really basic, okay? Like, and probably painfully basic for you, but <laughs> how about this first? Uh, I think a lot of people don't know a lot of these things. Why do we sweat? So we sweat because we evolved in Africa, or our ancestors did, very hot and dry. Um, if you're going to survive in a hot and dry environment, you've either got to avoid the heat or you've got to find a way to cope with it. So mm. we, the theory goes that we used to hunt during the hottest part of the day. We'd try and chase prey animals down, and mm -hmm. we're not that quick. A human can run at, what, 20 miles an hour? Yeah, he was the same bolt at 27, which is nuts. Whoa. I think I'm like 13, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I'll be about 11 yeah. or 12, I reckon, yeah. at best. Yeah. But we, so we're not catching a, an antelope yeah. at flat-out speed, yeah. but we can out-persist them, we can out endure them in the heat of the day because they pant to lose heat so they're very inefficient at losing heat compared to us who sweat so we sweat we don't have a lot of hair on our bodies we stand upright so we don't catch the sun as much mm -hmm. so basically the theory is yeah we would we would run after them for six seven hours run them into heat exhaustion and that was our competitive advantage mm -hmm. because anything that sort of persisted in in our genes is given as a 
competitive advantage. <laughs> now, what this means that nowadays is that humans are probably the best endurance animals in the heat on the planet. I often say to people, if we, we work with a lot with runners, runners sometimes run with their dogs, but in this, in, you know, a, running with a dog in the summer is a nightmare because <laughs> they can't keep up after a few miles because yeah. they just get too hot. Yeah. You yeah. can really hurt your dog by doing that. We oh, were talking about it. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, we, we basically sweat really, really well because it's a very effective way of losing heat in a hot, dry environment. Yeah. It's not quite as good in heat and humidity because obviously the sweat has nowhere, it doesn't have a gradient to evaporate into the air very well. Mm -hmm. So that's why heat and humidity is so much harder. It's why Kona's so hard as a place to race. Yeah. It can be like 90% humidity there. <laughs> that's crazy. Which is, yeah, so it's really tough. Let's go into that, because that's pretty interesting, is that it's is it the act of putting water on your skin that cools you, no. or is it the... It's the evaporation. Assume evaporation. Exactly. Exactly. evaporation. Yeah. Evaporative cooling, yeah. right? Yeah. And the process of the water evaporating takes heat away it's the phase change of sweat water to steam or water to you know vapor and so if you're in a place that has a high humidity that's less likely to occur than if you're in like nevada where we i think our office has like 18 percent humidity yeah, yeah correct sure. so i went running this morning out here uh i ran pretty hard it was reason you know it was, it's quite warm this morning in the sun and my t-shirt straight dry yeah. whereas at home it would be soaked to my skin because it's just evaporating off because basically you've got a gradient between the the, the you, you kind of get this moisture next to your skin as the sweat starts to evaporate and the gradient is really good for it to disappear off into the air yeah. if you go in a steam room where the it's effectively a hundred percent humid then the sweat actually just drips off and the problem with sweat dripping off is it takes very little heat with it yeah so then your body becomes warmer yep you start to sweat and it's a humid environment do you just continue to sweat more and more? Does your body keep ramping that up to a certain rate? Yeah, the theory is that you'll sweat a little bit more in the humidity and heat than you would in dry heat. I think I've seen a paper that looked at regional sweat in the body and it suggested that your body basically just does whatever it can. It, it, will, do, it will sweat more because the bigger the wetted surface area, the more chance there is for evaporation. Mm -hmm. The, the reality is, though, sweat, sweating into a hot, humid environment just is, is tough. So ultimately, your body, what your body's trying to do is shed heat so that you, your core temperature doesn't get too high because that can be fatal. Yeah. And it does that in lots of different ways. And obviously, it, this, the central governor theory, if you like, which yeah. you probably know about, it's, yeah. it helps to slow you down. So that's why people, if you don't tell people how hot and humid they're exercising in and set them off to do an activity, They've, there's studies that have shown they'll naturally pace slower because the brain kind of reads these things and goes, hang on a minute, we've got to step it down today. Yeah, I, I think so, we've all felt that too, right? Oh, yeah. Hot conditions, you're just capped. Like, yeah, you, and that's why yeah. we always talk about like, if you're training indoors, getting a very good fan yeah. or fans yeah. and having everything set up appropriately like that. 100% because it's, it's there for a reason as well. It's not a bad thing because when people can if people for whatever reason can overreach. So, you know, really elite athletes are, are kind of better than most of the rest of us at overriding some of the physiological signs that tell them to slow down. So you, I don't know if you, you guys follow triathlon much, but you might have mm -hmm. seen like Johnny Brownlee collapsing at, mm -hmm. you know, a few years ago in Cancun, yeah. I think it was, where his brother helped him over the line. Yeah. That was heat stroke, you know, or the, the, yeah. the start of heat stroke because those guys, and you know, the, the Brownleys are sort of, you know, phenomenal in terms of their ability to push, you know, yes, they they it's hard. it seems yeah. like, yeah, we they maybe so, yeah, they, it's like a lot of people accuse them of like selling it, but those guys push so deep. Like, oh yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah, think there's any selling it. It's like, yeah, it's like, I think it's a gift and they've got it for sure. Yeah. Like, they I mean, can go really I've, deep, I've yeah. raced against them in being from the UK and they were sort of coming through as juniors when I was a senior yeah. athlete and I've raced them in running races and stuff like that. And they just, they, you know, what's going to happen. They're going to go hard. Yeah. And, they, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's, I've got a lot of respect for the way they race actually. But, yeah. It's pretty um, impressive. But you know, it means that if, if we could just turn that ability off to, to not slow down in the heat, then you'd end up killing yourself basically. So it's there yeah. for a good reason. Yeah. So I guess along the lines of, of, of that's kind of why we sweat, but what we sweat is kind of the interesting thing, like yeah. what's actually coming out of us. Cause it's not just water, uh, to no. come out. What does actually come out in sweat? So largely it's, it's water and it's sodium or sodium and chloride because your so your sweat is drawn from extracellular fluid, largely from your blood plasma. Mm -hmm. Your blood is pretty salty. It has between 135 and 145 millimoles of sodium in it all the time. It's really tightly regulated. Mm -hmm. um, when you when you sweat, 
it moves from the capillary beds in your body into the sweat glands. It takes some of that that fluid and it excretes it onto the skin. And the as part of that process, the electrolytes, the sodium and chloride in particular, are are most prevalent in extracellular fluid. Mm -hmm. They're also valuable to the body, so the body tries to reabsorb them. And one of the theories is that the reason there's variation in the amount of salt that we lose is that different people's ability to reabsorb sodium chloride is is different based mm -hmm. on their genetics. So sure. at the extreme end, we have people with cystic fibrosis, which is a condition that affects uh, all sorts of things in their body, but one of them is the reabsorption of sodium and chloride. So they can lose almost 100% of the electrolytes mm. in their blood, in their sweat. So we've tested people with CF, they're losing 130 millimoles of sodium per Whoa. litre of sweat. So they, they literally are dumping salt. Almost all of it. Yeah. Wow. Wow, so Jonathan and I could have a drastically different amount of sweat or salt lost yep. so while we work out. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the range we're talking about here in the normal population is about tenfold. Whoa, so there's a bell, this is a bell shaped curve though. So the majority of people are going to fall somewhere in the middle and we get yeah. a few percent on either side. I'm on the high end. So I'm losing about just over two and a half times more than the average person. Why do you lose more than the average person? It's a, it's a good question, which doesn't necessarily, I don't know for sure, but yeah. it's been suggested talking to doctors and other people that it is to do with this CFTR function at the sweat gland. So, you know, if we haven't got my sweat glands for whatever, I haven't got a great ability to reabsorb sodium chloride. And my brother's the same and my dad's the same because we've tested them. Huh. Do you, do you lose, um, is it, so do you lose the salt at the same rate as your sweat? Like, so if you're sweating more, is it the same percentage of salt the whole time or does that change throughout? So the theory goes, and there are, there are papers that have looked at this, that the faster you sweat, the more salt you'll lose for okay. you. Got it. Um, I think that, that that's to do with the fact that there's less time for reabsorption of the sodium potentially. It there seems paper, logical, right? Yeah. There was a paper in about 2008, I think, that looked at this uh, all over the body and found that um, that basically as you sweat faster, you lose a little bit more salt. Now, I've found with myself, because I've done some sweat monitoring during prolonged exercise, that my sweat sodium levels are relatively stable almost no matter what the sweat rate, other people seem to change a bit more. Yeah. But, but I would say whatever, if you're someone who has an, if we test you at rest and you've got a naturally low salt secretion, so you're losing a little bit, then maybe it'll go up a bit during exercise, but I don't think it'll go up to the level that I'm say losing at or, yeah. and I'm not going to, even if I'm sweating slowly, I don't go down to that. So it's kind of, you stay in your, your, your bracket, your zone. Your zone. Yeah. We liken it to t-shirts. You know, it's like you're a small, medium, large, or extra large. Now maybe it drifts a little bit, Yeah. but fundamentally I'm always going to lose a lot. You yeah. might not. Yeah, exactly. So you can test the rate of losing salt at rest and kind of extrapolate like the differences between Jonathan and I and you. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. That's what we that's what we base a lot of our testing on. Um, that's super interesting. Because yeah. I was always I was thinking about that, like when we were thinking about because we've heard about testing, and I was like, well, how hard do I have to work, and doesn't that change at yeah. all? Like what temperature? Like, and yeah, then, yeah, yeah, all that. Yeah, because I was uh, that does that matter? I guess go, kind of going into the testing sort yeah. of thing, the environment does the temperature and he, relative humidity around you matter? Or? Only in that it'll influence your sweat rate. So if mm -hmm. your sweat rate influences your sodium loss, then yes, it will. Yeah. But basically, the more you sweat, the more net sodium you lose because it's per unit volume. Yeah. Potentially, the faster you sweat, the more sodium you're going to lose. And but there's a, and there is a lot of argument in this space. You know, we we get challenged a lot on these. Okay, well, don't you need to test in like five different conditions and this and that? Well, yeah, yeah. if you want to know exactly how many milligrams of sodium you're losing in a given day or something, then yes, you probably do need to repeat measure it. But what we're really interested in is kind of bracketing you, like I say, is whether you are, the, the difference here is like, are you losing a low amount, a medium amount, or a high amount, or a very high amount? Not, yeah. are you losing 1,037 milligrams or 923? You know, that, right. that's yeah. irrelevant. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's practical information versus strictly scientifically accurate information. Yeah. So here's a question I've always had. If I have a salty diet, yep. or if I eat a bunch of salt directly before I do one of these tests, will that impact the amount of salt that I sweat out? Uh, sweat out? 
Not to a large extent, I don't think. So at the extremes, if you have a very salt deficient diet, which is hard to do actually because it's so <laughs> yeah. pretty much yeah, everything. Really there, they did some studies many years ago, some really cool studies actually, where they took a, a doctor, took a group of people, I think it was in the 1930s. They lived in a house, they boiled their food three times and like stripped it of salt and they deliberately... Um, sort of removed all the salt from their diet and they found after a few days that they did start to see less sodium in their salt i think on the flip side if you eat absolutely loads of salt then you would imagine that you would be able to excrete more or you mm -hmm. might naturally do so but the primary mechanism that the body controls salt levels with is in the kidneys so you excrete more in your urine or mm -hmm. less based on what you're taking in so again it's one of those things that's probably strictly true yes you can influence it a bit by your diet but when we're testing a regular cyclist who hasn't been on a massively restrictive diet or hasn't literally just come back from mcdonald's and had you know, <laughs> loads and loads of salt and even if they had you know if we tested their urine we would see a ton of salt in their urine then but i don't think you know from the amount of repeat testing we've done i would say people's levels are relatively stable. It's kind of in that same bracket, yeah. as they were saying. So if I do yeah. have French fries mm -hmm. the night before a race, it's not gonna mess up my whole hydration plan for the next day? No, no, no. Okay. Fries for everybody. Yeah. Well, too, I, I take, uh, I've done the salt loading <laughs> for yeah. hot hydration. Does it, with that, so if that's an extreme, if I had salt load before a race, will that impact my hydration strategy the next day? Uh, it, it could do, yes, because the idea of salt loading is that, you know, people, often want to prehydrate before races and one of the biggest education points that we talk to athletes about is like you want to turn up to a race well hydrated what do you do you sit there you know in the days before drinking yeah. carrying a bottle around with you sipping nervously dry mouth because you're nervous yeah. everyone else is drinking you know yeah. and all you're doing then is you're going to flush w water through your body right whereas if you put a lot of extra salt in your diet and in your drinks immediately before you can retain a little bit more of that and i think for long endurance events or for very hot intense efforts when you're going to be pushing hard and you're going to be sweating a lot it's a beneficial idea hmm. but it, it requires a little bit of individual experimentation to see how much works for you yeah. because your body will to compensate right so if you're naturally salty all the time uh it's different like Correct me if I'm wrong, but you'll get a swing, right? Because your body will try to compensate. And you can only be in that like elevated salt level for so long before your kidneys go, nope, get all this out. Start kicking it out. Yeah, exactly. I mean, same with water. You know, we people drink loads of extra water, like I was saying before, races to prehydrate. Mm -hmm. But actually, you look at what... Um, fighters do before they're making weight before a competition mma fighters the boxes, opposite. <laughs> they'll drink a ton of water in the days a few days before yeah. to dehydrate yeah. because then you get this overcompensation you start weighing more then they suddenly stop drinking then yeah. their kidneys keep kicking out fluid for a, a few more hours or a day or two more and they get super dehydrated right. for the weigh-in then they take on a ton of salt and that. so i i always say to athletes you know whilst some extra salt loading could be beneficial and we recommend it in the build up to these events we're not talking about like massive drastic swings from what you do every day and every week because your body you know race day is just another hard workout mm -hmm. you want to you want to sort of give yourself every advantage but does, that doesn't mean changing everything in fact it probably means keeping things relatively similar yeah is there an yeah. ideal time then to salt load like before what i would do is the night before in the morning of because yeah. I wouldn't want to get that swing. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's exactly what we recommend normally is night before is a bit of a last minute top up. And we always say to athletes, look, maybe mix up 16 or 20 ounces of fluid, quite salty to to, to take, but, but drink it as you feel. You know, you don't need to nail the lot if you don't feel like drinking it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, the same goes for if you feel like drinking 30 ounces, you can. You know, it depends what you've been doing the last few days, how hydrated you are or not. Then on the morning, I would say, you know, an hour before, 16 ounces or so, maybe 20 ounces if you're a bigger guy mm. with, um, with you know, a decent salt concentration. We talk upwards there of, you know, 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams per litre to take that on and then have that an hour before, gives you an hour to absorb it pee out anything you, you don't need to. You've not got a horrible bloated stomach and you're not mm -hmm. feeling bad and then you're ready to go. <laughs> That's great. Shorter than I thought. When I when we do this, do you need any carbohydrate in that to be able to absorb it better during the preloading phase? So with car carbohydrate can improve the retention and absorption of fluid. If you're eating with that, as most people will be with breakfast, I don't think it matters about having 
carbohydrate in the drink specifically mm -hmm. but if you're just taking a, a solution for hydration something around three to four percent carbohydrate is good so about half the strength of a regular isotonic sports drink mm -hmm. but three or four times more sodium than a regular sports drink interesting huh <clears throat> forgive me uh, one of the things that i wanted to ask too is like I guess, does your body self-regulate on this in the sense that like kind of asking the question of how hydrated is enough? Cause I, I think like a lot of people, whereas there are certain things that we can measure and we specifically go for, but with hydration, they just kind of keep drinking on a, on a prayer, on a hope, you know, just hoping that they're drinking enough. Where's the limit? Is there somewhat, there's such a thing or does your body just manage that for you? you your body's pretty good at self-regulation. So as long as you give it an adequate amount of fluid and salt, then it, it will balance it out. Hmm. So when one of the ways you can tell how well it's doing on that is to weigh yourself every day for a while because mm -hmm. even after some massive workouts you know you'll probably find if you lose let's say four or five pounds six pounds in a workout which is very doable in the heat mm -hmm. you'll if, if as long as that's not last thing at night you'll wake up the next morning and your weight will should have got close to being normalized because you'll get thirsty you'll eat things you'll consume sodium afterwards and you know it, you'll balance it out mm -hmm. i did a a, a really long race for me I've, i'm raced long for quite a long time and i did a nine hour race two weeks ago <sighs> and we weighed me before <laughs> and after this race yeah and it was a fairly warm day at parts it was a swim run so and you can't drink a lot but i think i lost uh, about two kilos which is what about four pounds, four pounds yeah. but then you know a couple of days later or a day later i'm back to normal and you know i'm not i mean i it's maybe not a truly fair test because I've experimented a lot over the years and kind of feel like I know what I'm doing with the hydration nutrition aspect, but yeah. I still rely quite a lot on instinct yeah. to get back to there. And like I say, the body's good at self-regulation. So yeah. we, we need to, we need to get it about right. And people do screw up their hydration. They do screw up their nutrition because they get it way off. But if you get it about right, the body will sort itself out. That's an interesting point. Like I've seen that with some sweat testing is they have you weigh yourself before and after, yeah. but it's kind of tricky to know like how, like, like what are we, what's gleaned by that part of measuring, you know, I, I guess from the test, like from how much you lost, because who knows what that actually is, right? Exactly. Yeah. I think what's gleaned from it is if you do it once is a potentially spurious number. Yeah. Um, if <laughs> yeah. you do it many, many times, what you build up is a picture of how much you tend to sweat. Yeah. which is very useful. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it sounds like a plug, but on our website, you can download a spreadsheet. You know, it's just a basic Google sheet. You yeah. can, it tells you, there's a big blog on there that um, tells you how to measure your sweat rate. But the key thing is like we say, do it in loads of different conditions, loads of different days, build up a picture, you know, of how much you're drinking, how much you're sweating in these different conditions, different intensities, different modes of exercise. And what you're trying to learn from that is, okay, am I like, am I a big sweater? Am I like a two liters or more per hour guy? Or am mm -hmm. I a six or 700 milliliters per hour? Am I a real low sweater? Now you might have, you might kind of know that, but I think having a handle on that number is good. Mm -hmm. I think that doing one sweat test and then deciding that's your sweat rate is just That's crazy. tough to do. Yeah. Wait, so I thought before though, we said we could figure out, no. That was salt. Yeah, it was not just sweat. Salt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was going to ask now. Oh, you want to ask a question? Go ahead. Does your does my sweat rate change through my athletic career? Sweat rate? Yes. Yeah. yeah. More than likely, yes. The fitter you get, the more you acclimate to the heat, the better your body becomes at sweating. So, if you think about how a th what you think about how sweating works, you your hypothalamus in the center of your brain is regulating is measuring your body temperature at all times. Mhm. Mm it's got a threshold at which it starts to sweat because you, you it goes up a degree or whatever, and then it's going to start to sweat because mm -hmm. it wants to cool you down. Now, as you get fitter, the thermostat drops, so it's going to start sweating earlier mm -hmm. because it knows, okay, this guy is always getting hot. We're going to, I'm going to take preemptive action to cool down. Yeah. So you sweat earlier. You also sweat more efficiently and more profusely because actually when you're exercising you're about 20 percent efficient so hmm. if you're putting out 200 watts you're, you're producing 800 watts of heat and that's got to go somewhere right so the, the more you do that the longer you do that for your body just gets better at dissipating that heat interesting and could that change like in within the space of a year even like if a person from off season to peak fitness well, that could change in days in not, days yeah yeah, yeah. Not, not just and it will change seasonally if you, if you live somewhere that's 
really hot in the summer and really cold in the winter. For so, instance. so hence the importance of building up a library of data basically that yeah. you have. So then you can, cause whatever, you know, if you take the test early on and then you just assume that's the static sweat yeah. rate, it's going to change. Yeah. And it can change regularly. Yeah. yeah so like you saw our sauna today. Yeah. Yeah. That's where, you know, we obviously do that so that we sweat earlier and sooner yeah. and then we have better performance cause we should be cooler. Yeah. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. That's the theory because, behind it. Because huh. actually you're more, you're going to kill yourself more quickly through overheating than you are through dehydrating. Yeah. So now. <laughs> it's funny thinking of it in that direction. <laughs> the next question is, so what different schools of thought on that? Well, not, I guess there is. As you get dehydrated to a raise, is there a correct amount of dehydration? Like does performance fall off a cliff or is it kind of linear going mm. down the whole time? Mm-hmm. And how should we as athletes balance that? Especially yeah. a lot of people, especially runners and cyclists are concerned about weight. Yeah, like right? climbers especially, right? Yeah, yeah, for definite. So that's a really good question because, and that's been debated a lot, you know, and there mm-hmm. is the, the honest answer is there's no one size fits all answer. So I think things that are, things that we can sort of throw out straight away is you don't need to replace everything that you're losing. That was the 1990s theory. That's mm-hmm. what I grew up with. Like you got to drink, replace all your sweat losses, Otherwise, your performance is going to suffer well, during yeah. the whole workout. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's yeah. that's what logic says, right? That yeah. makes people throw up. Yeah. One in, one out. Yeah, <laughs> right. or it yeah. can give you hyponatremia if you're not yeah. careful, oh, yeah. which is really serious. Can you describe that for a second before you finish the answer? So yeah. hyponatremia yeah. is a dilution of your blood sodium levels. It happens when you either drink too much water or you sweat a lot and replace only you know low sodium fluids. Uh-huh. So people like myself, it's controversial, but it's thought that people like myself who lose a lot of salt are more at risk of hyponatremia because obviously I have to drink less uh-huh. in order to give us a relative dilution that's the same as someone who sweats a lot less salt. Yeah, which is logic. Just, is, is it really hard to get to that point? Depends how you look at it. I've done it to myself when okay. I was younger. Yeah. Um, and people die from it every year. So it happens. I think it happens more because because of this this kind of strange fear of dehydration that everyone has because the theory with the, if you ask most you know sort of non-technical athletes about dehydration it's just like oh yeah i need to drink more you know, yeah it's like dehydration <laughs> yeah. is the problem Overhydration gets a lot less airtime he's yeah. getting more airtime which is good <laughs> yeah because it's a balancing act but i think that de- dehydration the fear of dehydration is way more prevalent is it like um is it a, a state that you enter into and at that point hyponatremia or is it more of like a gradient like you become it, hyponatremic almost? yeah you would so so there was a study done uh, over seven years at the ironman frankfurt where they took blood samples from the finishes. I'm in Frankfurt is in August. It's pretty hot normally. Yeah. And they found that 10% of the finishes were hyponatremic to varying degrees. So hyponatremia, the definition starts when your blood sodium levels drop below 135. Oh, so wow. for most people, if you drop to like 132, you might feel a bit ropey. If it's like 129, you might feel really quite rough, but it gets down to like 120 and you're in real trouble and yeah. you get into the teens and people start, you know, getting into serious trouble or, or dying. Yeah. So yeah, it's a gradient and your body will do all sorts to stop you getting there. So you see people throwing up lots of water uh-huh. and, and, and hopefully you see them peeing a lot. You know, the body's trying to dump fluids, yeah. but it's, it's tough for the body when you're exercising because you pee less. So yeah. that's why you're more yeah. susceptible to it when you're exercising potentially. So what would be the symptoms? Sorry, I, I'm no, no, digging I, into this. I want to go like, further into this too. So yeah, you keep yeah. going. Perfect. Like what would be the symptoms that you would experience? And I'm, I'm get, and actually I'm getting it. Like, uh, when Chad and I did the Rockwell relay, that one race, it was like 50 mile an hour headwinds yeah. and it was extremely hot in Southern mm-hmm. Utah. And <clears throat> I felt like I just like the dry mouth was yeah. really rough and I wasn't drinking any mix. This is pretty early on in my cycling career. <laughs> yeah. I was just drinking water yeah. and I was going through bottles nonstop because I had a support car that was always giving yeah. me bottles. And I really, I got to a point where like my body was like shaking. It was like, yeah. even like hard, to like open up my hands, yeah. like uh, cognitive ability was completely gone. Mm. It was terrible. And I, I, I don't know, there could have been a number of different things, but mm. are there signs like that, that you start to feel with your body? Definitely. You, you, probably start to feel confused mm-hmm. lethargic um, you may counterintuitively get a dry mouth uh-huh. you co- might feel bloated you might get puff you know you might start to feel puffy because you your body's going to move fluid from the bloodstream out into the um, extracellular space and intracellular space so you swell up a little uh-huh. bit you can start to, some people start to cramp huh. 
uh, you you, oh. you you just a bit, bit nausea, <laughs> just feeling like lousy. Yeah. You know, like the, I had it in a, a long distance triathlon many years ago, and I just remember that feeling of like someone's pulled the plug, and I don't feel like it's low blood sugar because I'm eating and like that's not helping. Yeah. And I'm just I just feel terrible. You know, it's just it's really it's um yeah lethargy and. Really, like a bad hangover almost yeah 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 just, it's like you just pain. feel yeah. yeah and and you can get <laughs> cognitive disturbance because what happens is your brain starts to swell up because it absorbs fluid which is ultimately if people die from hyponatremia what they actually die from usually is brain injury because interesting because it, your brain swells and crushes against your skull so it's a pretty nasty thing holy cow crazy so can you get hyponatremia if you're drinking a sufficiently salty sports drink Yes. Oh, yes. Shoot. Yeah. <laughs> you can because ultimately even a really – so your blood runs at about – if we're talking milligrams per litre because that's what I understand best, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah of course. 3,600 yeah. milligrams per litre or so is how is your the saltiness of your blood. Mm -hmm. So anything like a really strong sports drink is about 1,500 milligrams per litre, and that's three times stronger than a normal one. Mm. So anything you're drinking is going to be relatively – more fluid than salt so you can drown yourself in those even if they're quite salty huh. the reality is though you know you you stand more chance of going hyponatremic if you're just pounding loads of water and sweating a lot so the yeah. idea is is to is to is to find that balance point french fries <laughs> lots of supplement french fries. with french fries exactly. yeah. yeah so i guess getting back to, to i guess where we're going with, with that very thing with you know taking in too much that sort of a thing and you kind of find a spot where you fall off a cliff yeah is the opposite also true like is is drinking performance enhancing to a certain point and then drops off or because i remember actually i think it was matt lieto i don't know if he said this on the one of the podcast episodes he was on or maybe it was just in a discussion but he was part of some sort of study where they just kept drinking and i think they had some sort of sports drink but it was like mostly like a sodium based yeah and he said that like he drank way more than he normally drinks and just kept going up 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 mm. is it like that like basically is there a point of diminishing returns where the more you drink you're not going to see an improvement in performance yeah for sure i think there's a there's a sweet spot Mm -hmm. That might be quite wide, depending on the conditions and depending on your physiology, but you can, it's, it's kind of obvious to say, but you can definitely not drink enough. Mm -hmm. And we've all done that and got yeah. dehydrated and your performance all of a sudden. And that, this happens more frequently to novice athletes, I think, because they just don't know what the signs are. You know, we, when you've been riding for years, you get tuned into that. Okay, I'm feeling a little bit more dehydrated. I've got to drink a bit more. Yep. You're probably keeping a mental inventory of, Actually, I, I've only had like half a bottle in the last 90 minutes. So I know that's on the low side for me in these conditions. I need to drink more. And yeah. a novice has got no idea. Right. So they're more likely to get to this point where they're going okay, feeling rough, and then off a cliff because they've, they've just they've, they've gone over the limit. They've gone too dehydrated and they're, they're not going to come back very well from that. Yeah. The same tr is true for over drinking as well, actually, because again, I did this, I did the triathlon in Nice in France, a long distance race, early 2000s, like 80 odd, 90 degrees, maybe. Oh. I was paranoid about hydration. So I'm drinking and I'm starting to feel lousy and I'm drinking more and drinking more. And I was not keeping that mental inventory of like, all right, I've already had two bottles this hour. So if I'm still feeling crappy, that's yeah. probably not going to help by like pouring more water on the problem. I'll probably right. go do something else, but I didn't. And I kept drinking, kept drinking then, <laughs> just because the only thing in my head was that, you know, I'd overridden that instinct. Yeah. So, you know, I think you've got to listen to your instincts to a degree and you can trust those the more experienced you are. Yeah. I think you've got to develop a rule of thumb for, okay, what, and you've got to have appreciation. So what is a small amount of liquid to drink per hour in these conditions at this intensity? And that's a really hard thing. And I sound really vague saying this, but, but the variables are so huge. You know, yeah. we've, we've worked with a, an Ironman athlete called Alan Hovder, who's won the Norseman triathlon, yeah. Phen phenomenal guy. He, t he told me this story, you know, I did the Norseman when it was zero degrees, like literally freezing. I drank uh -huh. one bottle on the whole bike ride and broke the course record. Like the <laughs> next right? year it's like, you know, 75, 80 degrees. Yeah. And he has to drink, you know, X amount of bottles every hour. Yeah. Because the same guy, same course, just different weather conditions. You got to understand in in cold, wet weather, when you're not sweating much, your fluid requirements, your electrolyte requirements are tiny, whoever you are. Yeah. 
In the heat, though, it's a different story. So we've worked with Tour de France riders who, on some of the bigger stages, are drinking three or four bidons this size an hour for acute periods. This is a standard size bottle for those that are listening, like yeah. 500 milliliter bottle. Yeah, or yeah, about 16 yeah. to 20 ounces, something like that. And they're smashing like three to four of those in for, for acute periods, not for the whole stage, but mm. for like that intense period when they're climbing and it's very hot and their sweat's pouring off them. Yeah. You know, because they realize that that's what they need to to stay to keep up with it so yeah. those requirements are so variable there's not kind of a one answer it's, <laughs> it's it's what can your gut absorb like a lot of people can't cope with more than about two bottles an hour otherwise yeah. their gut just starts to blow up mm -hmm. maybe some of that is to do with sort of talent for <laughs> being able to absorb or maybe yeah. i personally from experience have seen it more with big sweaters people who can really sweat can often really drink which makes sense you know yeah. intuitively yeah but there are other athletes we work with a a, an Ironman athlete who has, has been a world champion, who's done phenomenally well at the shorter distances, but constantly struggles in Kona huh. because his sweat rate is off the charts and he just can't seem to get the recipe right. For, he can't keep up. Interesting. You know, he, huh. It's just like a disadvantage for him. His sweat rate is so high that yeah, he he, sweats he's, too much. he's struggling to, to replenish. Huh. So is this like a trial and error thing? I, I know a lot of advice is uh, just drink to thirst. Yeah. Does this happen and with iron man though you can get behind drinking to thirst yeah so drinking to thirst is a good question because the, the there's a book called waterlogged that came out in 2012 yeah. tim noakes and that the whole book was like based on okay you're going to compile a load of evidence say all you need to do is drink water when you're thirsty and you'll be fine yeah. and i think that has a lot of merit in a lot of conditions and for a lot of people but it certainly doesn't have merit in really hot races really long races and people with really high sweat rates like if i did that I would end up in the ER for right. sure. Yeah. And we've had, we've got loads of cases of athletes who've read that book, followed that advice and have just bombed with it yeah. in certain conditions. Right. Like on a cool day doing moderate stuff, I can drink water to thirst, read my body and that's absolutely fine. If I'm doing a nine hour race in the heat, I need to get in front of the dehydration that's going to come later on. So I need to understand, you know, what, what proactive steps do I need to take? How many bottles do I need to consume early on? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I know you, you know, triathlon is an interesting case, but cycling can be as well in certain events where accessibility of fluids and timing mm -hmm. is kind of tactical or, or, you know, that has a bearing on in an Ironman. I want to get off the bike a little bit more hydrated because on the run, I can probably drink half per yeah. hour of what I can drink on the mountain bike. Mountain biking too. Yeah. yeah. Mountain biking. Yeah. It's yeah. technical sections or. Yeah. Or yeah. Whatever. It's hard. So yeah. can you like, so these longer races, can you get in a situation? I'm guessing Kona is one of them where you can't keep up it's like glycogen like in an iron man yeah. you can't keep up with yeah, the you can't yeah, absolutely. so most people will end finish an ironman and should finish an ironman or any endurance event even short endurance events dehydrated to an extent and the data seems to suggest that something between like two and five percent body weight loss is pretty normal mm -hmm. um anything if you're maintaining weight or gaining weight that's bad that's that's more likely to be you're going slow and you're running the risk of hyponatremia yeah we've seen like day a mile <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah i've seen i've seen data on athletes who've lost 10 percent body weight in wow. marathons and, and that kind of thing but that's rare that's a lot yeah holy and, cow and you know maybe some people can do that so i i think i've, I've been asked before and if it's like you know, put a gun to my head, what number do you want to say? I would say it's between two and 5% roughly is what you would expect most people to lose hmm. during an event. But the reality is that whether that's kind of by choice or by, you know, by following your instincts, some people, I just, there's, there is no, I keep saying it, but there's no one size fits all. You know, you can tell some people race an entire long distance race totally on instinct and they just do what they're going to do and they do really well. And that's that's doable, but it's also relatively rare. Mm -hmm. On the on the other side of the coin, we get asked all the time. I get sent spreadsheets by people who say, "Can you review this this is my hydration nutrition plan?" And it's like worked out to the nth degree. <laughs> oh, those are triathletes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'm sure if I was interested, they would tell me how many psi they have in their tires oh, yeah, and all yeah. these kind of things. And, and how that's going to increase and decrease ex depending on elevation and temperature. Ex exactly. We're very familiar yeah. with these because <laughs> yeah. this is us. Yeah. yeah. And these and these yeah. you know and I love that level of detail actually. I love it when people do go into that level of detail but what i end up doing with those people is saying so that's the plan but bear in mind that no 
plan you know survives contact <laughs> with the race yeah. and what you need to then do is go it's great to have a plan because it's a framework but that's all it is it's guardrails you know for me it's i went into the race that i did the other week in sweden this nine hour race with the the theory that i would drink somewhere between half a liter and one liter per hour to based on the temperature because that race in europe could that could be super cold mm. or it could be super hot yeah. and actually we were in between and i think i ended up we measured it i think i ended up drinking about just over half a liter per hour hmm. which kind of met with my expectation but i was trying to be mindful on each um because that one you carry a little soft flask with you which you can fill up at the aid stations mm -hmm. so i'd worked out okay hot day means two soft flasks per aid station you know, cooler days, probably one. And I yeah. ended up somewhere just in between the two, kind of close to the lower amount. But I went into it with a plan, but I was very prepared to flex that plan based on how I felt. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point also to break it down into like actually what you're going to be drinking rather than trying to do math when you're on the bike. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like a simple thing, Principles. but it really does go a long way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I think we've established that for dehydration, you get dehydrated, it's good to be dehydrated during a race, but then if you get too dehydrated, it usually drops off a cliff. Yeah, I would correct? say so. Yeah, I'd say you get a slight performance degradation and you'll notice that if you're monitoring your heart rate, that's always a really good sign actually because to look for. If your heart rate really starts to drift, if you're at constant power, and your heart rate really starts to drift, that can be a sign that dehydration is kind of kicking in hard and you should maybe think mm -hmm. about what you're drinking and, mm -hmm. and take action. So this is a pet peeve of mine. And you, <laughs> you hear this all the time is that, I think there were some studies, and I'm sure you're familiar with them, where they, they look at racers after the race and the most dehydrated racers have won the race. Yeah. To me, this is survive, survivor bias, where <laughs> the people who fell off the cliff and got too dehydrated, they, they slowed wouldn't, down they wouldn't be tested, and yeah. stopped at the aid stations <laughs> yeah. and drink water because yeah. they're like feeling awful yeah. and they come in not as dehydrated. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I'd agree. I think that what's happened is a much bigger problem in our industry, if you like, mm -hmm. is that over the years, hydration advice has had all these massive pendulum swings. So, you know, I'm, I talk about this all the time, but you go back a hundred years and the advice was like, don't drink anything. You know, there was a famous quote from 1909, I think it was, and a guy said, uh, James Sullivan said, don't drink or eat anything in a marathon. Some prominent runners do, but it won't benefit you. Mm -hmm. And then 1960s, uh, Tommy Simpson, British road cyclist, he was told by his coach, don't only have four small bottles of water in the Tour de France stage or something like that. You know, <laughs> just, you've just got to, it's just willpower. You just need to tuck it out. <laughs> yeah, because you know? that'll replace it. That, exactly, that works, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is why you see all these photos, I think, of guys in those days like raiding cafes and drinking yeah. out of fountains and <laughs> yeah, stuff because exactly. they were just very Stopping thirsty. Stopping at a waterfall yeah. or a creek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that was, and then, and then there's this big like pendulum swing in the 1990s or before 80s, 90s of Gatorade and all these this research saying you should drink as much as you can and dehydration is the is bad that's where hyponatremia started to be a problem and mm. that's where tim noakes and waterlogged was the kickback against that mm -hmm. because that was very extreme and that was you know bad science if you like or bad pub bad not not bad science necessarily but it was badly promoted and marketing people got hold of it and turned the story into a kind of just like a message to sell sports drinks mm. Then this pushback has come, just drink to thirst. The whole, my issue with that book, Waterlogged, and that's where I think some of those stats come from about the more dehydrated athletes tend to win races and things, is that he's felt the need to take a really extreme view to push back against another extreme view. So you end up with this constant polarization. Now, yeah. what the message is, is actually, it's in the it's in the, the weeds in between, it's in the gray area. It's like, well, yeah, probably a level of dehydration is good. And for athletes that are moving really fast who are sweating a lot, maybe they can't replace as much percentage wise as people are moving slowly. So it looks like it benefits you to be a little bit more dehydrated, but the inter individual variance in that is probably very high. Mm -hmm. So there will definitely be people that really suffer after two or 3% dehydration and others that can run at eight or 9%. It mm -hmm. also kind of depends on what you're doing, because if you're doing a stage race, you don't want to get 10% dehydrated one day right. because that's a big catch up for the next day. Yeah. But as a one-off, you know, the famous example that always gets quoted is Haile Gabri Selassie who ran very close to, I think, or maybe even broke the world marathon record and lost 10% of his body weight, which he was running fast at the end and doing fine, but he didn't have to get up and do that again the next day. Yeah. So he can yeah. then correct. So I think I'm not, 
I always, I, I never want to come across like I'm bashing these things, like the, the research around being a little bit more dehydrated than people sometimes think is, is quite illustrative and it's quite useful, but it's also not the be all and end all. Mm -hmm. There's definitely, you've definitely got to be sensitive to your own situation and, that was good life advice in, in general, right there. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So much we do. Yeah. We eat all the fat. Eat all the carbs. <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. That, that, that exactly is exactly what. it. That's yeah, what I yeah. talk about. So there's yeah. a few classic cases: carbohydrates and fats, like black and white. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing in between. Right? right now, it's like don't eat. Don't eat for like 20 hours a day. Yeah. yeah, yeah that's yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's and then before that, it was sorry. It was like you got to eat eight meals a day. Yeah. Exactly. Right. If yeah, you're yeah. not eating constantly, yeah, your whole your body's gonna. Yeah, the, yeah. The, other, the other one, which is less cycling and more running, is like the barefoot shoes. You know, do oh, you have yeah. like barefoot or do you have loads of cushioning? Yeah, yeah, yeah and exactly. Shoes now. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I, and I and I I laugh at that because I have both. I have really thin shoes for uh -huh. some of the time, and I have the really fat ones, and I alternate and do them differently because I think it stresses your body in a, a in different, different way. way. But if you're not part of one tribe or the other, you <laughs> yeah, know, you've yeah. got it. You've got to basically, if you're like a, a, a low carb warrior, yeah. then <laughs> you tell everybody too. Yeah. Oh yeah. You, you, <laughs> yeah, for sure. yeah, you have to, you yep. have to announce it on the internet. Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. One thing I want to cover with this is what's the best vehicle for hydration? Like, meaning like, should it be cold? Should it be hot? Cause I hear a lot of the time, like if you drink water, that's different temperature than your core temperature, then it doesn't get absorbed. Drink a liquid. It doesn't get absorbed as well because of having to adjust. Cold absorbs faster. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, I think a lot of that is like detail, it's very yeah. small detail because yeah. when you put, if your if your body's hot, if you put cold water in, it's going to stay cold for a very short amount of time. By yeah. the time it gets to be absorbed, it's going to be up, getting close to body temperature or body temperature. Yeah. So I think people overthink those things. It's like, it's always nice if it's hot to get a cold drink, if you can. Yeah. The, the one, the one thing that does make a big difference, I think, which they've proven with some studies is that if you want to reduce your core temperature having something which is actually ice as opposed to just cold is even mm. better because you have to your body has to change that ice to liquid and that's what consumes the heat energy yeah and that's so that's why you have these ice slushy drinks immediately before hot before the olympic games you know in the heat before the time trial or something because that just drops your core temperature yeah a little bit but other than that sense. we'd all probably rather have a cold drink handed to us <laughs> than a warm one yeah oh, it's my Can biggest pet peeve yeah. Yeah. okay oh yeah, yeah. Oh, i have a lot of pet peeves i guess this <laughs> yeah. is another Pet peeve. Can you imagine though Kona, you know, running in that and then getting hot water? Oh my gosh! Even oh, look yeah. warm, like air temperature water. I know it'd be yeah. terrible, right? Uh, what about like? Uh, and I guess that we kind of already answered this, but like the balance of sugar and salt. I, I see a lot of people keeping it like entirely separate, mm -hmm. where you'll see them taking in like a carb-rich drink that's like, and it, those, those usually have sodium in them. Yep. But like a carb-rich drink, and then they'll alternate with that with something that just has like sodium, right? And yep. then the, and something so like something like Martin and something like Scratch, and they kind of like switch back and forth between yep. them. <clears throat> Is it bad to mix those in in terms of actually getting the hydration or the, the the effects of hydration that you're going for? I think it depends a lot on the conditions that you're in. So you've got three types of drink, really. Mm -hmm. You've got um, hypertonic drinks that are a high tonicity. So they're thicker than your blood, basically. They yep. tend to be very high calorie. Mm -hmm. So the classic one that cyclists use is Coca-Cola. You know, flat Coca-Cola is hypertonic. It's about 10% carbohydrate. It, if you're low on energy, that's the thing to have because that's going to be straight into your system. It's not brilliant at hydrating you, but yeah. it is really good at giving you energy. Uh -huh. If you go isotonic, which is your classic Gatorade, Powerade type sports drinks, they're about six or seven percent carbohydrate, bit of electrolytes. They they're kind of the jack of all trades. They're good for delivering some energy, some fluids, some electrolytes. So they're kind of they they're best in short to moderate events where you kind of need a bit of everything but you're breathing really hard you don't want to eat stuff and you're just trying to keep your energy levels up and a bit of hydration i think when it gets hot and you're going long then that's when you definitely want to go hypotonic with your drinks so that's mm. either just electrolytes and, and water or very low concentrations of carbohydrates so like three two three four percent carbohydrate mm. so it's not very high in energy but because you're drinking large quantities of it because hydration is the limiter rather than energy consumption then if you make those too carb rich then you get stomach issues mm. you know so that's what we see a lot of the time is 
that you know you've heard you'll have heard loads of people say you know separate out your energy from your mm -hmm. bottles generally that's my preferred approach mm -hmm. but that's because generally i'm talking to people who's who are doing longer and hotter events where hydration is a concern i think the shorter the cooler the conditions the more you can get away with it mm -hmm. back to your point on people using like a carb drink and an electrolyte drink and like going between if it works it works but i think a lot of the time that's a little bit of like hedging their bets they don't kind of don't know what they need or what they yeah, want and yeah. it's like well i'll have one of these and one of these the worst thing i see though is when people mix it all together into one drink into one drink and make some kind of Super home, salty. home brew concoction <laughs> yeah. that is yeah. just basically too strong in every regard yeah. and then they get gut gut issues right yeah so, that makes sense because really you know you got to keep it simple what do you need when you're exercising fundamentally water you may need salt you need calories Right. And if you have those three things essentially kind of separately, you can tweak the dials separately. So on a, a hot day, more water, more salt, the same or maybe even less calories potentially. Uh -huh. um, on a cold day, lots of calories or a, a normal amount of calories, but proportionately way less salt, maybe no salt or less salt mm. and not a lot of water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Yeah, that's logical. Okay. How do we know how much to drink <laughs> and how much salt? We should do because now I'm all confused. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And that's the, that's yeah, that's where it ends up, and that's that is ultimately what people want to know. It's kind yeah. of, and the, I'll say it once more. Maybe I'll say it again after this, but there is no one size fits all answer to that. Yeah. So you have to work it out for yourself. So the first thing you don't do is just copy what someone else does, <laughs> especially someone who's really really successful, because you get that survivor bias thing yeah. where yeah. they've been really successful at this long hot event and they virtually just did it on drinking water and you know eating gummy bears or something. <laughs> that's because they're super efficient and they don't you know they don't have a high salt loss. Then right, you need to understand your parameters. So I would say instincts are good to follow and drinking to thirst and that kind of thing. You've got to try a bit of that and see how well that works for you at the same time though having an appreciation for your sweat rate so if you're my sweat rate can easily be two liters per hour so i know that i've wow. got to be you know working hard to get a good proportion of that back in compared with someone who's only sweating one liter an hour which is a kind of a more normal sweat rate mm. um, salt replacement so really the, the 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 playing field for that or sodium replacement Nought is the low end. Some people can get away with virtually none. Um, mm -hmm. I used to take around 1,500 milligrams per hour in a long, hot race. That's kind of what you would classify as a relatively high amount. Mm -hmm. So you're somewhere in between naught and 1,500. Hmm. And then what we would say is, you know, if you have had a sweat test, that can help tell you where to start your trial and error if you're a high guy it might be you start at a thousand or 1200 and then work it down you're always looking to try and get kind of the lowest effective dose that works for you mm. if you if you're so to give you a scenario if you're someone who you don't tend to race in hot conditions a lot you you have a moderate sweat rate you know your races are, are longish but not super long and you've not had loads of cramping problems and loads of hydration related issues then you're probably going to be in the like naught to 500 milligrams an hour range and you can play around in there and see how that works out for you. If if your sweat rate's bigger or you you feel a bit of um, you know, salt marks on your skin after long races and things, then um, you've had some hydration problems or a bit of cramping, you might start off in the 500 to 1,000 an hour ballpark. Mm -hmm. And then if you're a real like problem in the heat, cramps a lot, you know, pretty sure you lose a lot of salt, start in the 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams an hour range. The amount of fluid, though, can vary dramatically. You know, mm. I'd say a low amount of fluid for someone to drink during a, a, an event that goes on for multiple hours might be, you know, 12 to 16 ounces an hour. A high amount might be double that. But very few people drink much more than sort of 32 to 40 ounces an hour for a long race. Let's say um, yeah, go ahead. I'm very concerned about, I like to make all my indoor training highly efficient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So could I then on the indoor trainer weigh myself with the bottles I'm going to drink? Yep. Do my ride, track maybe the humidity and the heat inside of there. And if that stays consistent, maybe that's not a big deal. Get off the bike, weigh it again, all the empty bottles, empty bottles yeah. or bottles I've left over, see how much percentage I've lost and kind of track that over time to performance and get like maybe figure out my sweat rate yep. on indoor training so that all my rides could be pretty good. 
yeah, I think if you can get a, a regular handle on that and just, if you, it's like any science experiment, if you can control one or two variables and indoor training is good for that, same temperature, you can do the same kind of tests. You could try, you know, drinking nothing, drinking half of what you lose, drinking two thirds of what you lose and just seeing how you feel. There's always inherent variables with that though, because like how hydrated were you when you got mm -hmm. on the trainer that how day, tired how fatigued you are. You are. Mm -hmm. So I would always say, you know, it's like a feel factor thing. And really it, it is, it is a case of, first of all, accepting and understanding there's no one, one answer for everyone. The next one is starting to assess where you're at on those scales, you know, low, medium, high, very high for salt loss, for fluid loss, mm -hmm. and then being comfortable with getting your hands dirty and playing around with that. Hmm. That's essentially the best way. You got to iterate your way right. to what works for you. What Salt stains. That's the one we get a lot of questions on. Yeah. If I have a greater, I guess to simplify it probably, but if I have a ton of salt stains all over my kit all the time, does that mean that I'm a high salt sweater? Can I, dedu can I deduce that just from, from that at all? It's, it's one of those things that can potentially show you that, mm -hmm. but also it could just be that you're training in a, you're doing long rides and you have a high sweat rate and mm -hmm. you're training somewhere with low humidity. So all the water's evaporating off real quick. So sometimes it can fool you mm -hmm. because if you wear a black kit and you're training up at altitude where it's 15% humidity and you're doing five hour rides, you know, most people's kit is going to have visible salt on it. Yeah. Whereas in the humidity, you don't see it as much because your kit's always wet. Mm. So I, I definitely though, with a high sweat rate and a high salt loss, my chin straps on my helmet were always crusted with salt. You know, my eyebrows, my kit you know so there's a level at which yeah it's kind of an obvious marker i get that just with indoor training yeah like a two-hour indoor ride that's the you want like eyebrows. you have lice in your yeah. eyebrows yeah, yeah and then my kids kiss me and they're like ah, oh, gross so dogs lick you <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah are those signs of a high salt rate or or a high sweat rate because if you're yeah. sweating could at be a high yes. rate your net sodium loss could be reasonably high yeah so yeah you you have to you have to do a little bit more to deduce it for definite but it's a good it's a good sign to look at yeah so flipping it on its head i guess with this and assuming that it's not like an outrageous circumstance like a yeah or i guess a like riding at elevation that sort of a thing if you have never seen salt stains on your kit or anything else like that is it would you assume that that is a clue that you are a low sodium sweater or could, could well be yeah and yeah i think you have to look at all of these things in context with loads of other yeah. signs and symptoms basically yeah you know, we have on our website like a, a little quiz you can go through which has got an algorithm that sits behind it asks you questions about you know do you think you lose a lot of salt or not how long do you ride for you know in what conditions and it sort of starts to put you down a logic tree to say okay sounds like your losses are low sounds like your losses could be super high or, or whatever and right. starts to help you because we've got a lot of data on people now. So we use that to improve this algorithm and just try and help people start in the right ballpark, mm -hmm. the right bucket, basically, for their experimentation. Um, yeah. Do you guys have a product, too, that tests this stuff? Yeah, so we, we that's what we started out doing was a sweat test. Mm -hmm. So we we I mentioned cystic fibrosis earlier, which is the genetic disease where, amongst other things, your sweat glands don't work very well. Mm -hmm. So the test that we do is derived from that medical sweat test. So we actually stimulate the sweat glands in your arm and we take a sweat sample at rest. So it's a very easy procedure. It takes 15 or 20 minutes hmm. and it measures the salt concentration in your sweat. We're doing it. Yeah. yeah. We don't right even have this. to, we don't even have to train to do it. It's yeah. crazy, right? I'm so happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. we, we've had a lot of success with it over the last few years because it's a great way of getting a lot of athletes to understand the concept of the salt loss in their sweat and to help them start to quantify it. And as we talked about earlier, there's this argument, is this indicative of what you lose when you're sweating outdoors or when I'm sweating high rate or whatever? And the answer is that it's probably not identical all of the time, but from the repeat testing that we've done and the exercise based testing that we've done alongside the, 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 the pilocarpine induced sweating, which is what we do with the CF test, the numbers kind of seem to come out fairly close. Cool. So it's kind of in, it's indicative. So what would be really cool actually is we're going to test you guys today. I know you've got an exercise based sweat test that you can do. So yeah. maybe you could do that after and mail that off and see what kind of results yeah. you yeah. get back. See the difference. Yeah. Yeah. That would be cool. How long does huh. it take to get the results? They're immediate. So like it depends how, how big your sweat rate is, but usually it's about between 15 and 20 minutes. So that's just, and in this case, you actually have the equipment to test here, yes. right? But yeah. otherwise you would send it in to you guys? No, no, we or have no? different centers around the place. So if people oh, get cool. our website, they can um, 
fill out a form to see where their nearest test center is. Oh, okay. Cool. And what, what's, smart. what's very cool is that I think in the next two years or so, there will be wearable sweat sensors, which there's a lot being developed on the market. We're working with some people on some options there. And I think that's when we're going to start to learn a lot more about sweat profile during a five hour ride and things like that. that better see. be in the Apple watch. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what awesome. will you tell us about salt? Yeah. During this test. And then how does that then change how much I might take in a hot race or in uh, uh, indoor training? So what we're going to do is measure the saltiness of your sweat, the salt concentration. We're going to ask you a load of questions about your training, about what you drink at the moment. And, like, and then we're going to we're going to partly use some software, an algorithm that we've got in our software to kind of recommend where we would say that you would start out. But we'll also take into account a lot of your own experience because you're an experienced rider. So for a novice, we would use it as, as a blueprint for where to start them. For someone that's experienced, we always take where they're at now and say, do we feel like what you're telling us you're doing is is compatible with the results that we're seeing or do we think that actually experimenting with a little bit more a little bit less might be worth doing because if it's not broke we don't want to try and fix it mm -hmm. for you but if it if there's room for improvement we might make some suggestions interesting and if somebody cramps during a ride oh yeah let's get into cramps yeah people well, are probably yelling at us for not talking about cramps yet you know what yeah. i mean like yeah. so do you know what causes muscle cramps if i did <laughs> I'd probably be very wealthy. Exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. no one knows. You mean it's not pickles? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that prevents it. Yeah, yeah exactly. No, yeah, I'm yeah. just joking. Yeah, but, we're, yeah it's silly. Uh, yeah. But, but so, yeah, like, what do you know about it, I guess? Well, we don't I know. know why it happens I've got, entirely. Like, but. vast first hand experience of muscle cramping. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. so I used yeah. to cross the finish line of, I've got a, there's a video of me out there somewhere crossing the finish line of an Ironman, and literally my entire body locks up. Oh, just, did you just I, fall over? Yeah, and they just put me on a <laughs> put me in a little gurney oh. thing, and off I go. Oh my god! How painful was that? It was quite quite painful. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I was also yeah. kind of quite used to it because it was just for me as a youngster doing sport. It was like a thing that happened. I just got cramp a lot. It's oh, like the cherry on top. Like you just did an Iron Man, one of the most painful things you could do. <laughs> I know. Full body cramps. Yeah, yeah there you go. Oh. Right, have extra. Yeah, so this that was something you just experienced your whole life growing up. A lot of the time, yeah, and <sighs> I didn't, I didn't. I didn't know why it was just an, it's just one of those things. It was an affliction that you had to overcome. Do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions on that before we it, get yeah. deeper into it? Just, so did it always happen during, or did it only happen during long or only during intense exercise or did, could you find any sort of generally like trend, trend? more in long and intense exercise? So not, not short sprinting type activities. Mm -hmm. It would be during or quite often actually it was after. Mm -hmm. So I remember once doing, half Ironman UK had a pretty good race. I was in, I was in the pub afterwards having a curry with mm -hmm. my girlfriend and uh, a few, few mates and my left leg, just like my left hamstring just cramped so violently. I, my leg shot out and I just kicked the table over. So the curry went everywhere. <laughs> the beers went everywhere. Oh no! And then I would wake up in the night sometimes just in agony, you know, with my calves or hamstring just locked out. Yeah. So that, and that was one of the things that, you know, when I started racing in the heat, it would happen more and more. So, uh, and, and ironically, when I learned about the, the salt loss in my sweat, started to replace more the, the muscle soreness and the cramping that I experienced during and after long events was markedly reduced to the point now where I raced this nine hour race the other week and I wasn't brilliantly conditioned for racing for nine hours. But I think my longest training session was two and a half hours in yeah. the pre preceding months, but I got my sodium balance, right. I got my fluid intake, right. I paced it right. And I didn't, I didn't cramp the whole day mm -hmm. because I've learned to manage it. Yeah. Um, we've got thousands of people that we've worked with now who who have given us, you know, off from their own free will testimonials to say that we've you know, regenerated their careers and their lives by helping them in this dimension. But that doesn't make me a sort of flag waving advocate for the fact that cramping is about sodium loss. I think it's one factor. Yeah. I think again, it's one of these polarized arguments. Uh, it <laughs> used to be it used to be that cramping was to do with sodium. Now it's to do with neuromuscular fatigue or, yeah. or something else. Yeah. And what happens is both of these things, like fatigue and electrolyte imbalance and overhydration or underhydration or oversalting or undersalting, all happen at the same time, along with glycogen depletion, yeah. along with inadequate pacing, along with racing in climates you're not used to or altitudes you're not used to. All of these things come together. 
and they cause these you know overworked muscles spasms cramps mm -hmm. and unpicking what's happening is really really difficult so mm -hmm. you know definitely though from what i've seen there are enough cases out there and they always say you know i think the, the phrase is something like the the plural of anecdote is not data you know? <laughs> yeah. however the weight of anecdotes behind cramping and sodium depletion or sodium imbalance you know the when i talk to doctors about hypernatremia which is the condition where you you know you dilute the body's salt levels one of the things that doctors see even in hospital patients and things is muscle cramping mm -hmm. if they go hypernatremic so these aren't people doing exercise these are people lying in bed who've had operations and their fluid balance is all screwed up they go hypernatremic and they start to cramp mm -hmm. those people that, that study that i told you about when they boiled all their food and got really low sodium intake the guy was trying to write a journal uh, you know of, mm -hmm. and he would get cramp in his fingers when, <laughs> when he was writing it yeah um they he said that when they sneezed he'd get cramp in his intercostal muscles oh my gosh and so i think at the extremes so you must oh sorry the other the other one that i've been reading up on more recently as well is i noticed in this in the medical literature kidney dialysis patients often get cramps because when your kidneys don't work and you have to go on dialysis one of the things that the the people that set up the dialysis machine do the doctors they set the sodium levels and if they set the sodium levels too low quite often people seem to experience muscle cramping now it's not everyone and it's not all the time mm -hmm. but there was enough of it in the literature that i've read to go do you know what that's an area that hmm. links with this yeah. yeah i think there's evidence that that so lack of sodium is one cause of cramps but as you said there's a lot of other stuff so what people do is they say but in this study they took hot sauce and it and it stopped cramps yeah. so therefore it's not sodium exactly which that's the leap yeah. which i don't right. it's exactly. not bad it could it's a lot of things it's like what causes death yeah, yeah. oh i got hit by a buzz therefore heart attacks don't exist you're right exactly yeah yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah it's, it's it's definitely one of those there's those areas where people hate ambiguity yeah it's mm -hmm. quite it's a lot nicer to and it's a lot nicer to jump on a on with another tribe of everything you've just previously known was wrong about muscle cramps it simplifies it for yeah, us it's sim and we love right. simple things you know, our brains are kind of hardwired for simplicity yeah. if you if you got into the weeds of every single thing that you did every single day then you wouldn't get anything done yeah. so <laughs> sometimes it's nice to simplify yeah the problem is is that is the um, well there's that phrase about there's that famous quote about for every complex uh, question, there's an answer that is clear and simple and wrong. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and, exactly. And th th that's one of them. It's, it's just yeah. a, a phenomenally complex topic. People yeah. claim to understand and people will know a lot more about it at a physiological level than I do. But I'm kind of a simple guy in that respect that, and, and I do have my own bias here. Yeah. You know, there is a strong link for me with not enough salt equals cramping in long events. And we've seen that with a lot of people. But And I had to I had to get over my own bias to an extent a few years ago because I would just do that thing which we all do and read everything that you can find that confirms your theory and yeah, throw yeah, everything yeah. else out that doesn't. And yeah. you have to kind of man up and read the other stuff and go, <laughs> do you know what? There's, because sometimes people get cramps when they sprint 100 meters. Yeah. Or, yeah. You know, and they're not sodium depleted or they yeah. shouldn't be. I just had a guy send me an Instagram message the other day and he said that he got a calf cramp that ended his ride and it was before he left the car park. So like, and he was asking like, what the heck is going on? You know, yeah. well, I've had, I've, yeah. I had cramps once I had a really nice new triathlon bike years and years ago. I had it made Reynolds tubing, you know, like the old steel yeah, tubing. Yeah. And it was a 78 degree suit tube frame before they were before they were steep yeah, 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 I, had, yeah. I had one made specially <laughs> and it was brand new first race and there must have been a little burr of metal on the inside of the seat tube because it didn't clamp properly and the seat was dropping and i got <laughs> the worst hip flexor cramps in like a short distance race because i ended up with my seat like this that's all it took because because i was just pedaling at this obtuse angle you know the whole time and it was horrid for my hips and yeah. that was like a mechanical mm -hmm. cramp mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of, it was because I was stressing the muscle in a really weird way. It wasn't used to it. Yeah, exactly. It was, yeah. it was, it was an uncomfortable range of motion for it. So I think yeah. there's, there's other things, but I also feel like for whatever reason, I'm just one of those crampy people. I'm more likely to cramp than others. Mm. Yeah. So what I, I would love to, I hope I live long enough to someone to get to the bottom of it. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to understand it. Well, my sister says about that research, she's a, a scientist and she says that it like, strong opinions held loosely 
And that's a kind of a, mm. that's the thing you on the internet is if I have, uh, I really believe in this, but if you give me new evidence, shoot, I'll change right away. Yeah. And in the scientific world, that's actually like a, it's like a kudos to you, right? If you yeah. can change your opinion based yeah. on new evidence. A absolutely. And that's one of my biggest problems coming at this from, I have a, I have a scientific background. If you like, I have a degree in sports science, but I'm not a researcher. I've published some papers now with other, in collaboration with other people, but I wouldn't certainly wouldn't consider myself a researcher. But what I've found is that entering into that world is that people that when I can now read a lot of the papers that get published online about cramping or about hydration or about sodium replacement. And I read who wrote the paper and then I read the title and mm. I'll, I can pretty much guess what that paper is going to say. Because <laughs> what people do is they publish a ton of stuff that supports their pre-existing beliefs. Right. And that's partly human nature, but science is not anywhere near as objective as in a lot of areas as we would hope. Yeah. And you have to then kind of read all these different opinions. I just read a paper that came out recently, which is flying in the face of the current trend, which is to go and say, actually cramping has got nothing to do with sodium. Cause what they did was they took a bunch of cramp prone people and tried to, they put electrodes above, I think it was above their ankle and kind of, cranked up the voltage to stimulate the muscles in the foot and cause them to cramp. And then they gave them a placebo drink or they gave them an electrolyte drink and kind of randomized it, double blinded it and did it several times. Mm -hmm. And what they found was that the, when they gave them the electrolyte drink rather than placebo in a number of, I think it was five out of the nine, it reduced, it increased the threshold of electrical stimulation it took to get them to cramp, hmm. which is kind of interesting because it starts to show a little bit of evidence to the contrary to say, actually, maybe electrolyte replacement for some people can improve cramping. Yep. Um, mm. But I'm hesitant to sort of like, then what you see, because when I first read it on Twitter, you've got people just bashing it who, <laughs> and you've got people who are saying, this proves that, you know, it's it, all it, doesn't <laughs> prove, it doesn't prove anything. It's just like another piece of so, yeah. yeah. And that's one of my pet, one of my pet peeves is, <laughs> is or in all of these areas, cramping, sodium replacement, hydration, body weight loss is get out of the extremes because they're rarely right. Yeah. There's always some truth in them. Yeah. And yeah. A hundred percent. I'm excited to do this test. Um, recently there was a podcast where I wasn't on it and you guys were talking about hydration and you mischaracterized me <laughs> as you often do. I'm not here about how I in a crit I was going to drink, I don't know, 400 grams of or calories of carbs yeah, and yeah. drink two bottles yeah. on crits. I usually take my bottle cages off because those are Watts that you don't want. <laughs> yeah. So I've been doing this year races, like a few races in a row. And on the twice this year on the third race, I get such bad cramps in my hands that I can't take my hands off the bars, yeah. which is probably good, but I mean, it's well, better than the opposite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but then my performance just goes like, yeah. it yeah. immediately goes down. And I also, I think, so this is what I'm getting at. And I like your opinion, like your prediction too. I okay. think I am a high salt sweater uh -huh. and I think I have a high sweat rate. So I also yeah. drink more than like I would agree with anyone that. else. Yeah. Cause you, you can drink a ton and it doesn't seem to upset things. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I would assume that your body's offloading. It. And I I'm bet. a big person. I would, we didn't talk about that. Yeah. Like, so I'm 190. How much do you weigh? I weigh 140 by like, or 150 pounds. Is yeah. there going to be a different sweat rate too, between the size? Gen generally bigger body surface area, bigger muscle mass equals more sweating. Cause it's doing more work, producing yeah, more heat, produce more heat. You've got and more surface area to sweat yeah. from, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. What do you think you're going to be? I think I'm going to be a low volume, like low sweat volume sweater, I think. And, uh, I have no clue on the sodium side. I'm mm -hmm. curious. Yeah. I don't know. It'd be, it'd be interesting to see yeah. when we, when, when we surveyed a lot of professional athletes, cause we do a lot outside of endurance sports these days, we mm. work a lot in NBA, MLB, um, NFL, that kind of stuff. We survey a lot of the players before we sweat test them. And we ask them, do you think you're going to find that we lose a lot of salt in your sweat or not? And actually the trend was that the guys that do lose a lot of salt could generally predict it yeah. based on experience, not all of them. But, you know, there was a decent correlation with that. Huh. Not so much, it does, I don't think, with amateur athletes. Yeah. But but the, but very experienced athletes, if they've had issues with it or have kind of got a perception that they might lose a bit more, they've, they've maybe intuitively worked that out. So let's talk about precision hydration some. Well, I have, yeah. And I have, have two questions before questions. we get into the test. Um, yeah. So first one is we've talked about sodium 
and that's kind of like the main electrolyte, I guess. Yeah. But what about the other side of things? Oh, yeah. Like, like calcium, magnesium, yeah. you know, other people, things. They, all the drinks have different amounts and they like market it. Yeah, yeah they yeah. do. Yeah. So I think, you know, there, those are all those electrolytes are important <laughs> yeah. uh, for sure. Yeah. You tend, the bottom line though, is you tend to lose them in relatively small or very small amounts in your sweat because the, the main extracellular electrolyte is sodium or sodium and chloride. Yeah. So that's what you lose the most of. Like potassium, you might lose 100 milligrams in your per liter of sweat. I think calcium, magnesium, they're kind of single digits or mm -hmm. tens of milligrams. So they're, they're tiny amounts. Yeah. We put them in the drinks that we make to replace them. Yeah. Um, because it, there's no real harm in doing so. And there's a potentially a small benefit, but there's very little sort of evidence behind that. I think, you know, people sometimes get confused because they say, well, if you're magnesium deficient, that can make you more prone to cramping and it can make, and it can make you ill. And that's true. But a magnesium deficiency is more likely to be caused by a poor diet or poor absorption or uptake of magnesium, not by, you're not going to acutely lose enough in your sweat to cause a deficiency. Right. So okay. that's, that's the general rule there huh. with the small electrolytes. The other thing, and I don't know if you would have any information on this. We actually haven't talked about this at all on the podcast yet. Um, but, uh, I seem to be a non-responder to ketones. Like they don't seem to work at all. But the one thing that I notice is that I swear, like it just kicks, it like kicks off like a dehydration spiral. Yeah. I don't know if you've had any experience with this or if you know of that well, being any sort of side effect of that. I've not, I've not had any direct experience. I've tried ketones myself and a colleague of mine used them for a race that we did together mm -hmm. with quite good results for him actually. Yeah. But I think they're, I'm, I'm freestyling a little bit here, but I think yeah, sure. that ketones can be salt based and maybe it results in a very, very high dose of salt with them. I, I'm not sure on yeah. that, but that, that would be the, the one thing I would suspect could affect your fluid balance if it, if they involve taking in a huge amount of, of salt with them. Yeah. You just opened Pandora's box. Such a big yeah. can of worms. Yeah. But I, uh, if, if you're listening to I, this. I always wanted to, let me, just, I want, <laughs> can I, can okay, I do it? Please, yeah. Okay. So, um, what we've what we've done is we we've all taken some not everyone yeah we've been playing with some ketone esters uh -huh. which are super popular in the news right now yeah but also super duper duper expensive yeah. insanely they're like ninety nine bucks a serving aren't they or something thirty three dollars for three okay. dollars for like one serving it's yeah. it's insane we've had different people have be like different responders some people uh, here go this is amazing incredible and yeah. other people saying like john they go this has actually made me really bad yeah um yeah. we don't know why uh we've looked into research not sure if there's enough research so that's why we haven't covered it yet on the podcast yeah. we don't want to just be like hey we've got four anecdotal could be all placebo <laughs> yeah. impacts we have no clue on this product that's very super expensive yeah. that does no one any good right um so yeah but we were asking on the yes yeah, so yeah the, no I've, I've, thanks for being honest about that because yeah. it's interesting yeah. like it and it's something that i'd like uh i've just i've felt on two occasions but there's so many like to your point <laughs> earlier there's so many variables right and like trying to isolate everything yeah. can be really complex so i have no clue if if you guys are listening to this and you have any similar experience you can go this is episode 221 of the ask a cycling coach podcast and you can go to the forum and chime in if you've ever experienced something similar more to anecdote. that. Uh, just yeah. because once again, it's more anecdotes. It doesn't, it, it isn't conclusive, but it's an anecdote, just the same. I it's think, it's I interesting. Think the good thing. thing though, if ketones don't work for you, is that it'll give you loads more money to spend on bike paths, <laughs> exactly. yeah. like wheels and stuff oh, like that. I was like, carbon saddles, man, yeah. with carbon rails. Like yeah. uh, <laughs> it, it hurt me so bad to hit by now, and I did. And then after I took them, like I actually was really happy they didn't work. Yeah. Like usually you'd be really bummed if you spent a lot of money on a product yeah. and didn't work. And I was like, oh, thank goodness, like it's, I don't have to. It's like know. liking Miller Lite instead of expensive <laughs> yeah. wine. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Like, yeah. Your whole life, <laughs> yep. save money. Yeah, yeah. So cool. That's interesting stuff. Uh, Nate, do you have some more? Yeah. So uh, you guys have, and we've taken them in Kona. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your products. So you've mm -hmm. taught us a bunch. You have different levels of uh, sodium in different products, right? That people yeah. can buy. So really, can you just yeah. describe them all? Yeah, real simple. So again, we like I said earlier, we're, we're, we're simple, really. We've taken a simple approach to this. It's like t-shirts, small, medium, large, extra large. You, your standard sports drink has around four, 500 milligrams of sodium per liter in it. That's kind of, for whatever mm -hmm. reason, the industry has decided that that is the golden concentration for electrolytes. Mm -hmm. We looked at it and went with the testing, we're seeing a range of loss in people. Mm -hmm. I knew that I responded well to around about 1500 milligrams per hour in very hot, long races. And we, we tested some 
compositions a bit stronger than that but found that there was more risk of kind of gastric upset and people feeling a bit sick sometimes on stronger than 1500. So we, so our strongest drink has 1500 milligrams in. Mm. We then do one at a thousand, we do one at 500 and we do a 250. So essentially it's kind of a toolkit for people to play around with and go, mm. okay, how do, you know, which, which level works for me. Um, and based on either testing, based on our online questionnaire, based on trial and error and experience, yeah, I was uh, just going to say, does that show up then? Is it just like basically like a, a powdered mix then that you have? Oh, uh, we, we do a powdered mix or we do a effervescent tablet. Oh, cool. And for the endurance guys um, and girls doing ultra running or Ironman or whatever, we do a capsule you know, oh, that you okay, can just cool. pop with a with water. So when you're on the fly, you can just carry that. And that's the cool thing about that is actually we put it in a blister pack, which is thank you unbelievably super expensive yeah. <laughs> however very very useful because it doesn't get wet yeah, yeah. Well, without it though you can't do it so i'd rather pay the extra i mean how much more is it like a dollar oh, like a dollar or two exactly more, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we'd yeah. all rather spend a dollar and not have melted than to not have it at all yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> it's all, i've done that you open up and you're like your little, just, little fanny pack and you're like oh gosh yeah it's, yeah, it's, just, just, like of, it's just full of salt you're just licking it off your fingers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so i have a question let's say i take the 1500 milligram yeah and i have no gastric distress mm -hmm. And I notice no, like I'm, I'm, my performance doesn't go down. Should I just stick with that? Like if I don't have no downsides? What, what we would say is, you know, there's different ways of, of skinning the cat really. You know, if, if the 1500 is working well for you and you, well, you'd have to rewind and say like, why are you going to try the 1500 in the first place? You know, maybe you're a, you're a cramper or you've, you've, you've already said you've kind of pegged yourself as you've got high sweat rate, high salt loss. Maybe you want to try the 1500 and see how you feel. If it's, if it has a positive impact on your cramping, for instance, and no downside, then you would, yeah, you would stick with it predominantly. What you might do is I always carry some of that, but also some water, especially in mm. long races, because sometimes you, that's where the instinct thing is good. You know, you listen to your body. Sometimes water tastes great, doesn't it? You know, it tastes oh, better than, yeah, than the normal. Yeah, 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 because your body is craving it. You know, sometimes something salty tastes fantastic because mm -hmm. your body's craving it. So I always say, you know, listen to your body a little bit. Um, you know, I I'll pretty much predominantly use the 1500, but I'll mix it in with the odd bottle of water. Some people we, we work with, we use maybe one bottle of 1500 and then two or three bottles of water because they're, they need less. Whereas this, you could achieve the same effect by just drinking the 500 milligram ones all the time. Right. Is there's not, there's not a right or wrong answer, but, but it's just, it's playing around with it. And, this is so tough. You're saying take a nuanced, nuanced approach and <laughs> test yourself, <laughs> right? That's pretty much what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Experiment. Yeah, yeah. What, and what we do at, at Precision Hydration, we've got a team of people, you know, sat back in our office who are sports scientists or athletes or, you know, people who have experience with the product. And we get a lot of dialogue going with our customers because we, we sell them a product or they come to us and buy a product. And then they, they email us like, well, I'm using this gel with this drink. What do you think? Oh, yeah. You know, how does that interact or how should I use this in the building to my race? And we've noticed that, you know, we're a, we're a, a kind of a high contact organization with the people that, that buy our products, because one of the biggest problems with the sports nutrition industry is that in order to sell an effective and communicate a marketing message, you've got to dumb everything down to make it very simple. And it's kind of this one size fits all you take, or you go, you need to take between one and three of these an hour. <laughs> okay yeah. so does that mean two or does <laughs> yeah. that mean one or does yeah. that mean three so what we'll do is go okay well here's all of our information go to our blog you know do our online test do a proper test with us read the report that's the starting point but then iterate use as a resource email us call us we'll go through with you your experiences and let's see if we can hone this in because ultimately it's very messy and it's very individual and so it's all about you know just just playing around with it and, mm -hmm. and trying to get the the recipe. And I, I used to hate that message and <laughs> because it's so difficult to communicate, you know, people come to you as, as a coach or as yeah. a advisor and they want an answer. Mm -hmm. And it's so tempting to be led into the, the, the point of like just giving them an answer. And I think that's what a lot of people end up doing, or they end up giving them the answer that fits with whatever product they're pushing. What we've what we've tried to do more and more so is is say, look, we'll help you play around with this, and then ultimately you'll come back to us and tell us whether it's worked or not. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of tough to sell, but ultimately, hopefully, it makes 
it gives people, it empowers people to then get it right for themselves. Because for me, when I got this right, this was night and day. Yeah. And I was an extreme example and I, I recognize that, but I'm not the only one out there. Oh, We've yeah. got a lot of people that have, because that's the great thing about the, the modern age with business on the internet and information on the internet is that we're doing, we're advising people all over the world in Australia in South Africa and all across the US in the UK, all of these people that would not have been able to get hold of advice that we can give or relate to our experiences because geographically they were so spread. Now they can come and find that information out. So yeah, it's pretty cool. we don't want to sell the same product to everyone. We don't even want to sell a product to everyone we want to sell it to the people that really need it yeah and it, who it will work for because then you get they get massive bang for your buck they keep coming back to us as customers which is really nice to have you know lots of repeat business yeah of course and also it kind of feels good because you're not just shoving something down people's throats that don't <laughs> that don't want that don't want it or don't need it yeah that's been the problem with the sports nutrition industry to this point is it's like bang out as many units as you can. Just tell everyone what you're making is the greatest. It's going to solve all their problems. And then you end up with this constant like flip-flopping of people going, yeah. this is the best. No, this is the best. Yeah. It's just... Take an individualized approach instead. Yeah. This has been awesome. I've learned a ton. Uh, thank you, Andy, for doing this. No, thank, thanks, thanks for having me so on. Much. Where really can people it. find out more about Precision Hydration? PrecisionHydration.com. Cool. Uh, hello at precisionhydration.com is our email address shoot us an email a real awesome. real human being sits at the other end of it <laughs> <laughs> every day except nice. sunday because nice. we go riding and stuff on sundays yeah. cool we answered the email the other days um yeah the, i'd encourage people to check out the blog cool um it's keyword searchable now which is really helpful we got articles and everything and yeah, that's the best way on, on all the social media stuff, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, we're on all of those normally at precision hydration. I think we're just at the sweat experts on Twitter. Got it. But you Perfect. DM us on all those and whatever, or ask us questions and we'll try and get back to you. Great. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Andy. If you guys have further questions on this or anything to add anecdotes, like we talked about, toss in some more anecdotes on there, go to forum.trainerroad.com, search for episode 221. You'll find the post here and you'll be able to jump in and ask questions. And I'd encourage you guys yeah, to jump you, in on there too. Can you answer questions on our forum? If oh, anyone sure. has a question? Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we, cool. if that gets uh, flagged up thread. to us, then yeah. we'll, we'll, get we'll send it right to yeah, you. Do it. Uh, so you guys have it. Uh, this, that'll be awesome. And thanks everybody for listening to this. If you have questions about how to become a faster cyclist, of course, Go to trainerroad.com slash podcast. That's where you can submit those. We'll be back with a normal episode in, a, I guess, in, in a week from this time of recording because we're going to have another special episode for you later this week. Uh, and then in addition to all of all of this stuff, if you want to become a faster cyclist, like always, check out trainerroad.com. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, everybody, we're actually back for a short little bit because we figured we can't leave you on a cliffhanger wondering how our test results went. So we just did the test. Uh, it was super easy. We just sat on the couch and talked. Um, and, and we have the results from the test. Uh, do we want to go through the, the, the method, I guess, of what we did? Yeah, let's Get just see the results, it? right? Yeah. Because Get straight to it. It doesn't really matter. We yeah. sat on the couch. That's the important yeah. thing there. Yeah. All right, yeah, so what was it? So we, your sweat, Jonathan, was pretty average yeah 920 milligrams i think we measured it at which is yeah. essentially in the center of the bell curve yeah um, comparing with mine mine yours is uh just less than half what <laughs> Genuinely I, so I, half. Lose, I usually when we, wow. when i get tested i'm losing around 1800 1900 milligrams per liter wow so super salty 950 or so is about the average in our database at the moment and that's got quite a few thousand test results in it so pretty normal yeah basically and then nate yours was interesting because you made this you know you made a pretty confident prediction that yours would be high yeah and yours was up over 1300 which is reasonably high not off the charts but, but on the higher side and coupled with what we think is quite a high sweat rate that could that could explain some of the symptoms you've had when you're riding you know in terms of craving salt and and cramping and that type of thing Pretty interesting. It makes sense though. You you drink like so yeah. much whenever so, we're riding, like way more, way more than the average person would. I haven't cramped that many times, but when I do cramp, it's because I like I'm not consuming. But on the flip side of that, I do consume and crave like so much more than the average person. Mm -hmm. And people are always like, "Hey, you don't need that. You don't need that." And I'm like, I, I feels like I do. <laughs> so now I have some data, yeah. which yeah. is great. So, yeah. so I think like we were speak. well, uh, we were talking about earlier, you said, what would we then do with the results? And I think in your case, 
honestly maybe not a lot we might right. you know we might need to try a few a few different things sorry yeah. for jonathan it'd be mm -hmm. be the case of you know actually if you're meeting your your needs with whatever you're doing at the moment then it's interesting to know that you're in the middle but mm -hmm. we don't need to do a lot with that information potentially right with you though nate i would i think that we it, we would tweak up the amount of sodium that you're taking at certain times and give you some parameters to work with and just see how that how that plays with you because you, yeah. it, it it definitely that's at the you're at the the end of the spectrum where okay 1300 milligrams a liter in and of itself is you know not not off the charts but coupled with a high sweat rate you're talking about doing some longer hotter races so it's something we could get in front of and, and play around with before you go do that cape epic oh 2021 yeah. yep right um, around the corner we need to get your teammate tested too so oh, we, we have do. that you have, I mean, your teammate has to have all these things figured out, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. This is, this is awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Andy. Thank you. Really good. Um, and yeah, once again, if you have any questions on this, check out forum.trainerroad.com. Go to Precision Hydration. Check them out as well on social channels uh, all over the place or hello at precisionhydration.com. And we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Again. <laughs>